Now the Bible explicitly says that God created the world and everything in it in six days. So when exactly were bad things created? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name's Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now this week, we're going to be talking about when exactly were bad things created. Mm -hmm. That's Big our topic. topic. Yeah. Yes. So one of the most common questions asked of Christians is, is some kind of version of, well, if you've got such a loving God, why are there bad things in, in the world? Which is right. a good question. Yep. The implication being that if God created this world in the state that it's in, you know, well, he can't be very good uh, himself. Right. And uh, this is sometimes used as reason to reject belief in God, of course. Yeah, CMI's Creation Answers book, one of our most popular books, devotes a whole section to explaining this in great detail, providing not only a philosophical answer, but also addressing uh, more detailed questions like, what about animals that have attack and defense structures that seem designed to hunt and kill or, or, or protect them from, from activity like that? Again, this is because skeptics of biblical creation have used the argument, and, and it's a reasonable argument, yeah. that a, a, a good God surely wouldn't have created creatures designed to tear into other creatures and tear them to pieces. Right. It makes sense. Knowledgeable Christians will, will generally point out, this is a good thing to point out, that things capable of causing harm or, or defending against it were the result of the fall, which brought sin, death, and, and bloodshed into the world. But the question of when these physical attributes came to be remains. We're talking now about real physical mechanisms, right. not, not as abstract concepts like evil, where did evil come from, but real, the real physical mechanisms. That's what we want to talk about this right. week. So creationists often argue that creatures may be using their equipment, their teeth, their claws, et cetera, in, in a different way than they would, would have been post-fall. Right. Um, um, and this is reasonable for some instances, but, but it kind of falls short for many others. I mean, claws, teeth, poisonous fangs, and these exist along with the, the predatory instincts to use them. And if God created all things, um, then some would say, well, they must have been there from the beginning. Uh, some would, would say this defeats one of the most powerful biblical creationist arguments against millions of years, namely that there couldn't have been death before Adam sinned. Right, right. Uh, this is because it means that creatures must have been killing each other long before Adam came onto the scene. Right. Now, Exodus 20, verse 11, is, is certainly one of the most oft-quoted quoted verses to counter belief in millions of years uh, of supposed earth history and the universe and so on. It explicitly states that God created everything, the heavens and earth, and all that is in them in six days. But the verse can cut both ways because... Right. Uh, that then means that claws and poison and all of those kinds of things must also have been created within those six days, and the fall had not yet occurred within those six days. How then do we explain this? So there, there's the problem. That's our topic for today. Right. Is there any scientific backup for any, any scientific support for the biblical account here? Right. So the, the first thing we need to understand is that God wasn't surprised by the fall. <laughs> of course right? not. Yeah. He wasn't surprised by the fall of Adam. <laughs> uh, God's all-knowing, and so he knew that a punishment would have happened uh, had to be meted out following Adam's and, and his offspring's rebellion. Sure. So according to scripture, at the time of the fall, the environment changed, and there were changes in the physical construction of um, some things as well. For example, thorns appeared. There were no thorns before. Uh, right. There were thorns yeah. after the fall. Some might uh, ask, well, doesn't that mean that God uh, must have created new genetic information for those things uh, at the time when there was none before? Uh, not necessarily. Because hidden genetic information can lay dormant within living things and be activated under certain environmental conditions. Right. For example, evolutionists were declaring proof of rapid large-scale evolution <laughs> when Italian wall lizards were transplanted from one island to another. They exhibited large-scale changes in behavior. They, they were no longer territorial, for example. Their food preferences went from predominantly carnivorous to, to vegetarian. And their morphology, morphology their, their, build, their building plans uh, changed. Mm -hmm. They had larger heads. They even uh, had the production of sea kelp valves 
to assist in the digestion of plants. It, it, and all of this happened in, in just over 30 years of living in this new environment. That's right, and astonishingly, the DNA sequence of the newer lizards seemed identical to the parent population, right. which means that the genetic information for cecal valves, along with the other genetic information accounting for the other changes, were already present in those creatures, which means this gives no support for evolution, which requires new right. information that never existed before to arise through random process. It was likely the, the environment itself activated the needed genetic information that caused the changes in these sub subsequent populations. And we'll get into more of this when we get back. In 2004, New Scientist magazine published an open letter to the scientific community in which 33 leading scientists blasted the Big Bang. Their strongly worded letter included statements like, The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we have never observed. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. But the Big Bang theory can't survive without these fudge factors. An open exchange of ideas is lacking in most mainstream conferences and doubt and dissent are not tolerated. With such growing dissension from secular scientists, it's unfortunate that many Christian leaders have embraced the Big Bang, especially when there are so many contradictions between it and the Bible's account of creation in Genesis. And Genesis is the word of the Creator who witnessed creation, unlike any scientist. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So if you just tuned in, we're talking today about uh, when exactly were bad things created. Now, we, we were just commenting on how these, uh, these wall, lizards wall lizards contain the inbuilt genetic programming to be able to adapt to different environments and how that's not evolution. The information was already present. Right. Yeah, CMI's Dr. Don Batten commented. He said this, It is significant that the cecal valve is present in other herbivorous lizards in this family, so it is not surprising that this particular species has the ability to produce cecal valves under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the equivalent to how your computer may have uh, like an antivirus program. Hopefully it does have antivirus <laughs> program, which monitors for threats. So you may, you may not even realize that this is running in the background. It's constantly monitoring the environment and under certain conditions, it activates and brings certain features online, and that's when it activates. Right, it's a good analogy. Yeah. Well, uh, here's an even more amazing example. Um, Don't make me hungry. You wouldn't like me when I'm hungry. <laughs> now, that humorous line was delivered uh, by the fictional character Dr. Bruce Banner in the 2008 movie The Incredible Hulk. Oh. And uh, so that the doctor's trying to tell some antagonists, look, not to make him angry because as he attempts you know, but he's attempting to speak Spanish and he mis Spanish, mis yeah. mistranslates this, <laughs> the, the word angry for hungry. And of course, the reason he's warning them is that because under duress, uh, this character, you know, he turns into this, uh, this in, in, incredible rampaging green monster known as the Hulk, right? And uh, so this, uh, this metamorphosis or whatever, he, he's desperate to avoid this kind of thing. Right. So yeah. upon uh, calming down, he then transforms back into his former Former self, right? right, and although the Hulk is fictional, obviously, scientists have discovered that certain creatures can literally transform much like the Hulk, yep. and, and, and not with their life cycle programming, like, like butterflies and frogs, like that kind of transformation. Right. It's, for example, when they get hungry under certain environmental conditions. For example, up to the 1920s, scientists used, uh, they, they used to classify grasshoppers as a separate species to locusts. Mm -hmm. However, researchers have since determined that they are actually the same creature. Under certain circumstances, and, and these circumstances are reproducible in a lab, they exhibit a, a kind of Jekyll Hyde, <laughs> like Banner Hulk transformation. Yeah. And, and it's startling, the, 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 the amount of transformation that happens there. That's right, because their behavioral uh, differences happen immediately at the transformation, uh, but then physical changes appear in subsequent generations, and uh, there's there's a difference in behavior. Uh, grasshoppers are solitary; locusts swarm. Um, there's a difference right. in morphology. Locusts have smaller legs, wings, and bodies, um, but have a 30% larger brain than grasshoppers. Um, there, there's significant uh, changes in neural musculature and exoskeletal expression as well. And the transformation from grasshopper to locust can be reversed back again. And again, the DNA of the two creatures are identical. Yeah, it's amazing. This ability for DNA to express different programming from the same source code under different environment, uh, environmental conditions is actually fairly common. 
the epigenetic code, a mm. set of switches that turns genes on or off, for example, in response to environmental stimuli, is the main contributor to this ability of, of the, the, the finished product to vary despite the same DNA instructions. It's known as phenotyp phenotypic plasticity. That's right. So a, kind of a crude analogy with this would be like a, like a Swiss Army knife. Right? Well, you got okay. your Swiss Army knife and it's got these multitude of different tools that are available for use uh, depending on the circumstance, uh, but they all come from the same source. Uh, what's amazing um, is, is scientists are now saying this latent genetic information can be hidden within the DNA of these creatures, right? So the obvious question is, what other information might there be in creatures that we just haven't seen yet? Right, yeah. Right. Not only is the discovery of latent genetic information an incredible challenge for evolution to account for and, and a tremendous evidence for design mm -hmm. uh, because it exhibits all the characteristics of foresight and pre-planning in, in the genomes of creatures around the world, but it also helps answer the supposedly unanswerable question regarding how bad things appeared after the fall if God's creation was completely finished by the end of the sixth day of creation. Right. For knowing the fall of man, God created the features of a post-fall world in latent form within his very good world. They only became activated when God cursed the creation as punishment for Adam's transgression, for his mm -hmm. sin. And the entire creation groans because of that curse and is evidence of something, it, it's something that's desperately wrong with the world. If, if God hadn't cursed our physical environment to change at the time of the fall, then we would be lost without him, bound, bound for hell, mm. but still living in a virtual paradise. How would we know that there's anything wrong with, this, with, with ourselves and that we need a savior? And we'll, we'll look into more of that when we get back. The vigorous promotion of evolution as established fact is causing many Christians to question the biblical creation account. And some non-Christians won't consider Christianity because they believe the Bible has been disproved by science. That's where Creation Magazine comes in. Creation Magazine is a family-friendly publication packed with cutting-edge science that supports the Bible, presented in an easy-to-understand format by some of the leading experts in their fields of study. Visit creation.com to subscribe today. Okay, on this week's episode, we're talking about when were bad things created. We just outlined uh, the biblical creationist response to the question, but if you believe in an old earth or evolution as a Christian, if God created everything very good, does that include, for example, sharks that kill people? <laughs> does, does, <laughs> right. how, does, how does that work? Right. I mean, this is one of the main arguments that unbelievers use to attack Christianity and, and its image of a, a, a loving God. Sure. Re yep. Regrettably, most Christians have no answer uh, ready when someone challenges them with this seemingly loaded question. And unfortunately, many Christians have never ha uh, have a good answer because they believe that the earth is billions of years old and that death actually preceded Adam's sin. So they don't right. really have a strong answer for why there's death in the world. I mean, death must have just been one of the ways God created, but of course that totally uh, goes against the, the gospel message. Right, yeah, the, the whole problem of evil involves far more than just things which people inflict on each other. Uh, even if we could somehow overcome human selfishness and cruelty and war and, and, and those kinds of things, the world wouldn't suddenly become a paradise where we could live happily ever after. It, there, would, there would still be uh, the savage stinging tree, for example, mm. the, the most venomous plant that there, that there is on the earth. There, there would be man-eating saltwater crocodiles or, or, or the deadly box jellyfish, the most poisonous creature on earth. There'd still be those things. But even if all of those things were eradicated, you'd still have sickness and, and death. You'd, you'd still have those things. So we would still face the same question, why is there death and suffering in this world that God created? Right, and, and theologians have been trying to come up with a, a good answer for this uh, question for many years. Many theologians now insist that there never uh, could have been a real time when evil entered a truly good world. Right. Things have yep. been bleeding and dying for millions of years, they think. So, so in this view, the curse if Genesis even held to be historical in any sense for human origins, was the beginning of human death only. Right, of course, Bible skeptics will logically attack old earth creation and theistic evolution by rightfully saying that God must be a moral monster right. if he created a world where parasites, uh, diseases like cancer, death and bloodshed were commonplace right from the very beginning. And then he calls all of it very good. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah, but it isn't as if uh, Bible skeptics have any answer to the problem of evil themselves. 
right? When, when challenged by an unbeliever, one strategy is to ask them to defend the idea of good versus evil right. using their own worldview. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, before an atheist can complain that God's evil, he's, he's first got to give a justification for any differentiation between good and evil. And if we're simply the result of some mindless process over millions and billions of years, well, who gets to decide what's right and wrong anyway? Right. According to the atheistic worldview, for example, right and wrong, and all morality in general are merely the result of mindless chemical processes in our brains, uh, a byproduct of a survival advantage inherited from our <laughs> ape-like ancestor, etc., etc. Following this to its logical conclusion, we can say that the ideas that forged, uh, for example, the Nazi empire under Adolf Hitler were forced to obey the same chemical laws as those in Billy Graham, let's say, that resulted in thousands of conversions to Christ. Right. If we're thinking according to an atheistic worldview, then which is more horrific, the terrorist who kills thousands of people or the spider who kills thousands of flies? Exactly. Right? I remember when uh, one of the U.S. elections, Sarah Palin was uh, uh, brought forth as a, as a camp, you know, candidate right. to, and, and so on. And uh, Matt Damon, the, the actor, you know, he said, well, do we really want somebody who believes in creation, you know, to have their finger on the button, you know? And, uh, and I thought Gary Bates, our CEO from, uh, from the U.S., had a great response. He said, well, do you really want someone in the, you know, in the presidential office or having any kind of influence thinking that we evolve, all evolved from bacteria over millions of years? I mean, what do you do to bacteria when you got too much of it? You just, you just get rid of it, right? Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, see, see, right and wrong, they're creative. Christian concepts. They're, they're they are. grounded yeah. in, 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 the, in the book of Genesis. An atheist actually has to borrow from the Christian worldview to justify any distinction between good and evil in the first place. So right. the argument that atheists uh, use to say that, well, God uh, he doesn't exist because of all the evil in the world is actually founded on biblical principles um, themselves. So, so in order for them to make this argument, they'd first have to be wrong. So uh, they've got this huge dilemma. So, anyway, we'll be back in just one moment. In 1994, the prestigious journal Science shocked the scientific world by publishing sequence data from DNA retrieved from dinosaur bone said to be 80 million years old. DNA is a fragile molecule, and so it breaks down quickly. Measurements of DNA stability suggest it could last thousands of years at best under the likely conditions. But 80 million years was just too incredible for other skeptical scientists. Eventually, these skeptics were vindicated, as it became apparent that the original researchers had sequenced contaminating human DNA, not dinosaur DNA. However, in 2012, a different group of researchers published new results supporting the discovery of actual dinosaur DNA. These new results appear much harder to disprove, with the researchers applying multiple checks against contamination from non-dinosaur sources. The preservation of dinosaur DNA doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective, but it fits biblical history, whereby dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit at our website, creation.com. So our subject today is, when exactly were bad things created? Right. We've just seen that atheists have no, no standard, or their, or their standard is quicksand, uh, for, for good and evil, right and wrong. On the other hand, we as Christians have an absolute standard, a very solid standard for morality, for right and wrong, given to us by God in His Word. Many Christians cheat themselves out of the best answer to, to this dilemma that we're talking about this week by failing to trust the Bible's history recorded there in Genesis. Exactly. Um, without a literal Adam, whose disobedience literally resulted in the death of humans and nephesh animals, uh, Christians are left without a coherent answer, uh, just as much of the atheists. Um, in other words, if Genesis isn't uh, literal history with a literal very good creation, with a, a literal Adam and, and Eve, with a literal sin and a literal fall, how much more literal do we need to get here? Yeah. <laughs> then sin did not literally enter the world through the actions, and therefore you and I don't literally need to be saved. Right? Okay, so how could a loving God just sit back and allow all the death and suffering in this world? Well, the question assumes that God hasn't done anything. Right. In fact, God has done a lot already to solve the problem of evil. He has promised to do even more in the future. If God had immediately judged all of humanity and gotten rid of evil, the, the, the evil rebellion that causes death and suffering today, 
Adam and Eve would have died instantly, and then none of us would be here. We, we wouldn't be around to complain about why God isn't doing anything about death and suffering. So. Exactly. Beware of what you, uh, uh, what you, you wish for. for yeah. Yeah. And, and so also the death and suffering that goes on in this life, it's a powerful reminder that something's wrong with creation. And more than that, something's wrong with the human heart and, and our relationship sure. yep. with God. Suffering often points people to Christ. Who, who, who's God's ultimate answer to the problem of evil. Yeah, and God promises a future complete elimination of death and suffering, but along with that is an elimination of all evil and rebellion against him. Only those who've been forgiven of their sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ will have an eternal life free of death and suffering and pain on the restored earth. God offers the free gift of salvation to everyone, even though none of us deserve it. None of us deserve that, but it's offered to everyone. Uh, however, anyone who refuses this free gift is subject to eternal punishment. While many don't like this idea, and even many Christians minimize it, mm. God's justice is inseparably linked to the solution to the problem of evil. Right. I mean, is it God's fault that there's death and suffering in the world today? Not at all. No. As Christians, we understand that because of our sin, our world is the way it is, and that there is a loving God in the midst of pain, tragedy, violence, death, and we either have to accept the gift of eternal life that God offers us through His Son, or reject that precious gift and suffer the consequences. Um, it, it's not as if becoming a Christian will somehow enable you to avoid bad things uh, happening in this life. Not in this life. Yeah, I mean, you look at our ministry, Itself, you know, Dr. Carl Whelan started uh, Creation Magazine and, and, and just a pioneer yeah. in, in yeah. you know, with, with the whole topic of creation and, and, and the ministry. And uh, you look at his story, you know, he's the, the grandfather of CMI. Um, and uh, you read his book, Beyond the Shadows, and, and it's just unbelievable that what he went through as a servant of God. I mean, he's serving God. Right. And, yeah. uh, and, and you can see here in this, this picture, here's the mangled wreck with, that, that Carl was uh, seriously injured in in 1986. Uh, he, he, he was trapped inside this vehicle fought for five and a half hours after a head-on collision at highway speeds. I mean, a, a fully laden uh, you know, fuel tanker. This is in the outback of Australia. Yep. Uh, there's, yep. there's hardly anybody around. 56 surgical operations over the next seven years. Um, his book has, has details of his personal trauma, all sorts of uh, fascinating and different insights, of course, into healing, um, and especially the powerful way in which uh, the creation-based understanding of the Bible's big picture helped him cope with the things that he was going through. Um, as a yeah. matter of fact, you can get the book, um, Beyond the Shadows, at 30% at off, if, uh, if you just go to the website, uh, look up the book, you can use the coupon code CMLBTS and you can actually get a copy of, of Carl's book. And I know that many people that have suffered personal tragedy reading that book. There's great comfort in it. It is yeah. great comfort because it, it's certainly someone that you can't say, well, you don't know what I've been through. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you read Dr. Carl's story, it's just, just incredible. So I encourage you to check that, uh, that resource out. And uh, we'll be back in, uh, in a moment to, to discuss this topic more. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Well, welcome to the feedback section of the show. And uh, we've got some feedback from a, a fellow from New Zealand. He's actually a supporter of the ministry. And this, this really relates to uh, what we've been talking about today. Right. Um, and so the, the fellow started his, um, his letter to us this way. He said, I'm an evangelist and really endorse your ministry. You give me the tools I need to counter the evolutionary arguments I face. I just wanted to say that I don't believe the Bible says the earth is young. It may be young, and I've read your many articles on scientific evidences supporting this argument, as well as your articles on interpreting Scripture uh, as saying it is young. However, I do not believe Scripture says this, and I'm concerned that you are trying to defend a position which is not necessary to defend. All your other work is so wonderful that I would not want you to try to defend a position which is not biblical, 
and then maybe lose that argument or have the whole ministry discredited. You uh, don't need to reply to this. It's just a concern of mine that we, uh, we don't get tied up trying to defend what the Bible doesn't explicitly say. So, an okay. interesting point of view. All right. Yeah. Okay, and uh, one of our guys responded this way. Yeah. I've carefully read your email and note that you are an evangelist, a very significant calling and task at any time. You may wonder why I'm responding considered, considering you said that it is unnecessary. Perhaps it will help you to understand if you put yourself in the position of just having received an email from someone who says, for example, the Bible doesn't teach that God is a trinity. I've looked and looked, but the word trinity doesn't even appear in the Bible. Now, and, and, and then end quote, uh, I'm sure you would find it difficult to resist pointing out <laughs> that the person, uh, pointing out to the person that at least some of the many, many ways in which the teaching as a deduction from combining verses, uh, various threads, and separate teaching it is not only a very, very important one, but a blindingly obvious one. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you would also want that person to have the opportunity to at least consider things they likely have not done to date, including not just Bible passages, but also theological implications from evidence in the real world. For example, the implications of having bloodshed, death, disease, suffering before the fall, which is, uh, which is what long ageism must imply, since the fossils show these things, then if they are millions of years old, it means that they predated Adam and hence the fall uh, slash the curse, and so that's that's part of the response. Right. I mean, it's interesting as this man is an evangelist that he hasn't encountered this concept before, because most people will bring this up. Hey, well, if you've got such a loving God, why is there death and suffering in the world? As soon as you accept millions of years uh, of, of Earth history, you've got death and suffering before Adam sinned. Shot yourself in the foot. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, the response continues, and it, then it, uh, it then also means rejecting the clear teaching of the global nature of the flood. This is huge. Right. There are long age creation ministries that push the idea that the earth is old. Consistently, they all deny the global nature of the flood, but one only needs to read Genesis to see if that's even uh, remotely possible from the language. Do you really want to be on the side of the scoffers in 2 Peter 3, 3 to 6, even if only in part? Um, this is an important prophecy that says in the last day, scoffers are going to come and they're going to deny that there was a flood. Now, if you're telling people it was yep. a local flood, you're saying that this prophecy says in the last day, scoffers will come and they will deny a local flood. Folks, nobody denies a local <laughs> flood. There's been thousands, thousands of, of huge local floods. What people deny, what scoffers deny, is a global Yeah, flood. creation, and they're, they're creation deniers and flood deniers is what was what Peter's talking about there. Exactly, so, exactly. Amazing. So uh, you can actually get a copy, a free copy of Creation Magazine. What well, is this, Creation Magazine Live? You Digital can get a free, copy. Yeah, yeah, free copy of uh, Creation Magazine. Just go to the website, uh, creation.com slash free mag. You can get your own copy of uh, Creation Magazine to Have see what it's it. about. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and next week, come on back next week, what will the restoration be like according to Genesis? That's our topic next week. We'll see you next week.